Welcome to the Art of Freelancing. I'm Noah Bradley, and I'm going to be talking today about everything I wish they had taught me in art school. Now, first, let me quickly introduce myself. I am a full-time freelance artist, concept artist, and illustrator. I tend to work in the fantasy and science fiction fields, and I do a lot of environment and landscape painting. If you're not familiar with my work, you can go ahead and find it at noahbradley.com. Now, I'm producing this video because there is a clear lack of knowledge about how to freelance. Art schools are doing a really bad job, in general, of educating their students on how to actually freelance. I had the personal experience of going to a required business class in my department at art school. And I thought this would be a great thing. I thought it was a great idea. I thought it was great that they were forcing everyone to do some business classes. The problem is, is that the class was absolutely terrible. Now, I'm not saying anything bad about the teacher. He was probably a great guy. He probably knew a lot about what he was talking about, but he knew absolutely nothing about the business of freelancing. And I have found it all too common that people complain to me that their art schools are simply not teaching them any of the business or marketing aspects of art. They teach them the art and design aspects of things, but never the business side of things. So it's my goal with this video to help educate some of those people that were lost in those gaps in art school, to help those people that would love to freelance and would love to make a living with their art, but simply don't know how. And I think I'm in the perfect place to do this because I have a fair bit of freelancing experience myself, but at the same time, I'm not a super established pro that's completely forgotten how to break into the industry. It was recent enough for me that I remember it distinctly. I remember all the challenges along the way. I remember all the mistakes I made. And hopefully I can convey some of that so that you won't make those mistakes or you won't have quite as much trouble as I did. Resources. I'm going to be talking about a lot of different books and sites and tools for artists and designers during this talk. And rather than you writing down every little thing that I say, I'm actually making a special resource site just for this video. And this is a list of resources that I won't be giving out to anyone but the people who have purchased this video. and I have compiled an extensive list of resources for anyone who wants to freelance. I'll also be keeping this list updated with brand new information as I discover new things or as people send me suggestions. So after you watch this, if you have any questions or any comments, please do not hesitate to email me. You can email me at noah at theartoffreelancing.com. And with that, let's get started. Part 1. Getting Started. In this first section, we're going to cover the very basics from what freelancing is to common concerns that a lot of people have before they get started to questions that everyone seems to ask. I'm going to try to answer all of those questions to the best of my ability. And at the end of this section, I'm going to get into portfolio building, probably a question that a lot of people have. So first off, let's define what freelancing is. What does it mean to be a freelancer? And the simple definition is that you're a self-employed, and in our case, creative individual. And rather than work in a studio and have a common day job where you go there five days a week to the same place and work with the same company every day, uh, you work typically from home and you work for a number of different clients. Now freelancing is actually an interesting topic for most people to grasp because they're used to their nine to five day jobs five days a week. And so you'll find if you start telling people that you're a freelancer, they will immediately assume that you're unemployed. This is perfectly normal. Uh, I get this all the time. But it is starting to become a little more accepted and recognized that people do freelance and people actually do make money. We're not all homeless. Now, once you get past the stigma of being a freelancer and that being a lazy bum, uh, you get to the dream of being a freelancer, the one where everyone working their 9-to-5 job is extremely jealous of you. And we're going to call this the ideal freelancing life, what people think freelancing is like. The first thing a lot of people think is that you make your own hours. Uh, you work whenever you want, which is often a couple hours a day, maybe, and sometimes not that. 
Secondly, people think you work for whoever you want. You pick your clients. You get to pick and choose your jobs. You have so many jobs coming in, of course, that you can only pick the best ones, the most fun ones. And you get only those choice jobs, whereas in a studio you'd have to deal with the boring jobs and occasionally get that fun job. And third, uh, you work wherever you want. Uh, if you feel like working at a coffee shop one day, you can go there. If you feel like working in bed one day, you can go ahead and work there. Uh, next, uh, you make more money, uh, clearly, because you're self-employed and all of the money goes directly to you and not the company. Uh, you're making tons of money. And lastly, and in general, is just the fact that you have absolute freedom. Freedom to sit around in your pajamas working all day or not working all day. You have the freedom to come and go as you please. You have the freedom to work or not work as you please, take vacations whenever you want, hang out with friends, live that ideal artistic life. And that's all a great dream, but as you might expect, that's not entirely what it's like. I will say it is pretty awesome, but it's far from perfect. The reality is that yes, I do make my own hours, but those hours are often longer and sometimes worse than if I were working a 9-to-5 job. Uh, take for instance, you've got a tight deadline. Uh, in the case of a studio, you probably wouldn't have to deal with that. That wouldn't be your problem. It would be the company's problem. When you're on your own, it's entirely up to you. You have deadlines to meet. You are the one responsible. So, if you have to work till midnight one night, you have to work till midnight one night. And if you have to work till 4 a.m. that night, you have to work till 4 a.m. I think if you asked most freelancers, they would say that they work many more hours than their typical 9 to 5 compatriots. But even though the hours are long and sometimes miserable, uh, I do get to pick when they are, which is extremely useful and one of those advantages that freelancers have, which you can never, never imitate in a typical 9 to 5 job. For instance, if someone called me up tomorrow and said they wanted to hang out and do something fun, go hike or something, I would be able to say yes. I would be able to take the time off and work some other time. Of course, I, if I had a deadline, I wouldn't be able to do that. But if I had a little advance notice, I could easily take any day off that I wanted. I could take a week off if I wanted, if I killed myself doing work the week before, that is. And to cover the second point, uh, yes, I do get to pick and choose my jobs. Sort of. Uh, I am not to the point where I can really do that comfortably. Uh, I'm still at the point where I need the work more than I necessarily need to only pick the best and most fun, enjoyable, creatively fulfilling jobs that are out there. But it is certainly true that at some point, once you're really, really, really good, very established, and extremely well known, that yes, you do get to be very picky about the work that you take on. But I think it's fair to say that for at least the first few years, uh, you will have some very boring jobs that you will have to take on to support yourself. And the third point, um, yes, I actually can work wherever I want. And this one's actually pretty true. Uh, I really haven't found much of a drawback here. Um, to, in this day and age, uh, unless you actually need to be on site for the job, which some, some jobs you will need to be on site, uh, you can really work wherever you can find re reliable internet connection. So at least for that point, uh, the dream is true. And the fourth point, money. Yes, it's true you can make more money. That's certainly possible. You have that ability. But it's also true that you can make a lot less money. And it's also extremely true that your income will be very unsteady. That is to say, most people get a paycheck every week or every other week. Uh, sometimes I go a month, for instance, and I will not get any income. And then the next month I will somehow make up for that. But it's kind of a scary way to live. So even though you might be making a little bit more money, a lot of people can't take the stress of such a variable income. 
Another factor people seem to forget when it comes to how much money freelancers are making is that they hear the hourly rate and they're like, oh my God, that's two or three times as much as I make. But they forget that freelancers have a lot of unique costs that people working at a company don't have because the company takes care of all those costs. Uh, things like insurance, things like overhead, uh, all the supplies, all the equipment, all the software. All of that, rather than being paid for by the company, is all the freelancer's responsibility. So an almost depressing amount of money actually does not end up in the freelancer's hand. So at the end of the day, it's true. The freelancer's life is not exactly perfect, but it is pretty darn sweet. I'll be honest with you. I really, really love freelancing. Uh, the fact that I can come and go as I please, the fact that I do make my own hours, the fact that I can take days off, and just the fact that you feel in control. Uh, with a company, you're not exactly in control. You're one part of the company. With a freelancer, you are everything. Uh, how well you do comes down to entirely to how well you do, how well you yourself do. There's something very invigorating and empowering about that, and it appeals to a lot of people, which is probably part of the reason you're listening to this video. So I will say this. I will say that freelancing can be very scary. It is very unsettling for a lot of people. Uh, there's a lot of risk to it, but there's also a lot of reward, and it's a very fulfilling lifestyle. Uh, one that I've enjoyed greatly while I've been doing it, and I hope to do it for a long time to come. And I hope in some small way that I can help you on your own personal journey towards freelancing. So let's get right to it. Uh, I've broken down freelancing in two very simple steps. It's not very difficult to become a freelancer. And the two simple steps are, first, one, you make great work. Secondly, you show it to people who commission that kind of work. It's really, really that simple. Naturally, that's easier said than done, but it's important to remember those two simple steps because that's what you're shooting for. And step one of making great, awesome work is not really what we're going to be talking about in this video. Uh, there's plenty of videos out there. There's plenty of resources out there on how to get better at your craft, whatever that might be, whether it's illustration, whether it's concept art, whether it's graphic design, whatever it happens to be, there's plenty of fundamental videos out there that you can watch. So if you don't have awesome work yet, uh, you can still get a lot out of this video because you're going to get a better idea by watching this of the things that you're going to be preparing for why you're doing all of this work, why you're developing your craft. And when you have that foresight, uh, your work all of a sudden has more direction to it. You know where you're headed. So step two is where we're going to be spending most of our time today. It's all about getting your work in front of the right people. And even though I've broken this down into just two steps, uh, freelancing really is extremely difficult to do. Making money and making a living as a creative person, whether whatever that is, illustrator, uh, graphic designer, web designer, whatever it is, uh, it's not easy. I mean, I don't want to depress you guys or scare you, but it's good to be a little bit scared because it's good to realize that this is not an easy field to get into. It's not an easy field to make it in, but it is certainly possible. Just not easy. I believe the statistic is, is that of art student graduates, who you'd think would be pretty well set up to become professionals, uh, I believe something like 95 to 99 percent of them will not be doing anything art related five years after graduation. So that's a pretty terrifying statistic. And I remember hearing that one when I was just starting out in art school. And naturally, I just assumed I was not going to be one of those people that failed. I just knew and didn't even question the fact that I was going to be successful. And that almost stupid level of confidence enabled me to really push myself to be successful. Uh, it made me set those goals so high because I knew the cost of failing that I ended up working my butt off while I was in art school so that I was able to be successful. And it turned out pretty well for me because I was freelancing 
pretty much full time during my entire senior year of art school. But don't let that discourage you. That's not exactly common for people to do that. Uh, I guess I just got lucky and I worked really hard, uh, which is really a lot of what success is. I think it comes down to working very hard, to persisting and sticking with it for a long time, and then getting a little bit lucky never really hurt anybody. So while you're working on becoming a freelancer, while you're developing your skills, while you're doing everything that we're going to be talking about today, while you're marketing yourself, building your portfolio, it's very important not to get discouraged because it's often a very slow process to become a freelancer. In fact, I've heard many people say that it takes anywhere from five to 10 years before you're really established as, as an artist. And that's after you're already somewhat professional quality of work. Uh, so it's a very slow process. So take your time. Don't rush it. Don't think that you need to be professional full time working with the best clients next week. But rather plan out for the long term. Plan out for what you're going to be doing for the next several years. It's really easy to look at the professionals out there now and you see how successful they are and how well they're doing. But you have to realize that most of them had a very long road to get where they are today. Most of them didn't just wake up one day and, oh, I think I'm going to be a super awesome professional today. No, most of them went through years and years of getting there, of developing their skills, developing their brand, marketing themselves, getting known, building their client list. It's often a very long process, even for the people that make it look so easy. And even though these people make it look easy, often if you actually sit down with some of them, as I've done, and talk to them about it, they will tell you just how hard it was, uh, how they had you know, difficulty paying rent when they first started out. So try not to base your assumption on the industry and how hard it is to get in on people that were in it you know, 20 years ago that are doing just fine now and can coast a little bit. Not completely. They still do a little bit of marketing. They still work and they still have to try to break into you know new fields and stuff. But it's not nearly as hard as that guy getting out of college who's trying to get that first job. So one of the concerns a lot of people have when they're talking about freelancing is they're worried that they're going to be selling out. They're worried that they're going to be sacrificing all of their creativity and all their expression for some commercial gain. I know when I was in art school that I was in the illustration department and the painting department would often give us a hard time because the painting department was full of artists who created art and they created art for art's sake and then the illustration people were trying to make art so they can make a living and somehow through some messed up way of thinking that was somehow worse that was somehow lesser and unfortunately this is a very common stigma that illustrators and designers have to deal with the fact that they are often labeled as not real artists. Uh, Norman Rockwell, for instance, he went his whole life and despite being a fantastic artist, um, constantly struggled with the belief that he was not in fact a real artist and just an illustrator. Uh, I've even had you know teachers make that claim and it honestly drives me up the wall. Um, I have no issue with saying that an illustrator is a great artist despite the fact that they are doing illustration work. So what I usually tell people when they bring up this issue is that if you would like to remain pure, or like to remain pure to your artistic intent and your own personal creativity, uh, you are more than welcome to do that. Uh, but I cannot guarantee that you will not starve. And if you really do need justification of some sort for doing work for clients, for creating someone else's vision, uh, just look back at all the old masters and you will find that most of them worked for patrons or they worked for the church or someone with a lot of money who was willing to pay them to create a commissioned piece. Another question I hear all the time is, am I too old? Am I too old to start? And people asking this will vary in age. Uh, I've even seen people that were 15 years old asking if they were too old to start learning art or start too old to start learning design. And of course there's people in their 50s asking, am I too old? And there's a very, very simple answer to this question. 
And that is probably not. First of all, I will say that no client I've ever worked for has ever asked me how old or young I was. So really, it doesn't matter in the freelance industry how old you are, because honestly, most of your clients are never going to even know. Uh, when I first started out doing freelancing, I was still in school, and I made a point of not telling anyone that I was in school, because, well, who wants to give work to a student? So clients really just don't care how old you are, where you are, or anything like that, as long as you can do the work and communicate clearly. Now there's also the concern that if someone starts at, say, 45, uh, it's going to take them too long to get to a professional level. They'll be in the grave before they even get going. And it's really not the case, because with a certain amount of devoted effort, you can probably get to a professional level of work within five years to maybe ten years. Naturally, some people are going to take longer than this, and some people can take much less time. It really depends on the person. So if you really want to be an artist, you really want to be a designer, don't worry about it. Go for it. It doesn't matter how old you are. You might start a little later than someone else, but that really doesn't matter. You can still be extremely successful. Now, the next question that I get asked all the time is, should I go to art school? Should I get a degree? And my first response to that is usually you will never, ever get work from your degree. Never. It's not going to happen. Your work is solely going to come from your own portfolio, from the portfolio you develop, from the work you put into it. Now that said, there is a lot of worth to getting training, to get some sort of instruction. It's going to help you along. It's going to teach you faster than you can probably teach yourself. But in the end, whether you go to art school or not is really a very personal decision. It depends a lot on who you are as a person. And I could get into this for a very long time, and I won't because that's not really the topic that we're talking about today. But I will say that you really need to just figure out what is the best way for you to get the training you need to do what the sort of work you want to do. Now for me, that was art school, and I found art school extremely beneficial, and I definitely think it was a good decision for me to go. Now could I have gotten to a professional level without art school? Sure, I would have gotten there. And the thing is, is that it probably would have taken me longer. Uh, art school for me gave me a very concentrated way that I could study. It gave me a place and a time where pretty much my entire life was devoted just to studying art. It also surrounded me with people with common interests. It gave me a network of friends that were all artists. And so it did a lot of good for me. It exposed me to a lot of different art. And I'm extremely glad that I went. But at the same time, I have seen plenty of artists and designers that were self-taught that are doing extremely well. And I will repeat once again that the degree itself, that piece of paper you hang on your wall, is not going to get you a job. It's all in the portfolio. With the one caveat that occasionally with in-house jobs, they will want a degree, but they won't necessarily need one if your portfolio is strong enough. An issue a lot of young artists and designers have is they don't know when they're ready to actually start working. When are they ready to freelance? And now I will say to start off is that there is such a thing as starting too early. There's a danger if you start too early that you're going to be starting at the very bottom. You're going to start with some extremely amateur work and that work is going to get out there, it's going to get printed, it's going to get seen and your name is attached to all that stuff, and so you're going to start to build this reputation as sort of a lower tier artist or designer, and that can be extremely hard to break out of. Because you'll start to get a client base that expects a certain level from you, expects a certain price from you, and they're going to refer you to other clients who will expect the exact same. So rather than get into that rut, it's best to start at a little bit higher level. And some people differ on this. Some people say to start getting work as soon as you can. Some people wait until you get to the very top tier. And I will say that it's good to break into the industry when you're around the middle to upper level tiers. You don't want to start too low, but you also don't want to wait forever. So as tempting as it is to start getting work as soon as you can, it's not necessarily the best decision because just because you're doing $10 drawings from DeviantArt, it does not mean you're a freelancer. And if you're doing somebody's logo for 20 bucks, 
you're just doing somebody's logo for 20 bucks. It doesn't really solidify your position as a real designer. There's no more pride in doing something for 20 bucks as doing something for yourself or something pro bono. So the best way to know when you're ready is to compare yourself. Compare, compare, compare. It is the ultimate way to figure out if you're right for the industry, if your work is up to that level, that it's professional. And the way you go about doing this is extremely simple. You take a selection of your work and you take a selection of professional work. You take it from whatever industry you're in and you put them all side by side and see if your work fits in, see if it blends. Or does it stick out? Is there something that your work is missing still? Is there some certain amount of quality that you don't have yet? Now, a lot of people have the difficulty of seeing their own work objectively. They're too attached to it. It's their own little baby. But you need to start developing that skill. It's an extremely useful skill when you're an artist or a designer. You need to know where your work stands. But if you really can't see your work objectively and you really don't have any idea where it's at, then you can always ask a professional. Get a portfolio review. Get somebody who's in the industry, knows what they're talking about, to take a look at your work. Take a look at it and give you some input. Just whether it's right or not for the industry. Just whether you're up to that level or not. Now here's a step that everyone seems to forget about in art school. Uh, at least from my own experience. And that is to research. And what do I mean by that? I mean research the field you want to go into. So many people that graduate from art school or are training themselves to be an artist want to be an artist but they have absolutely no idea how they're going to be an artist. They just have this mysterious idea that once they get good enough, once they get all the skills to become an artist, that they'll magically be able to make money somehow. There will be somehow a field out there that's perfect for exactly what they do. And I hate to break it to you, but this is not really going to happen. Because you need to find people that will pay you for the work you make if you want to be a freelancer. And this isn't really the time when you're just starting out to create your own unique field, your own unique job just for what you do. This is the time to start getting your feet wet, to start getting established, to start making an income. And the surest way to do that is to start researching the field you want to go into and start researching the sort of jobs that are in that field. You'll very quickly find as you're researching the fields is that everyone has its little quirks to it. Everything has a little thing that they do differently than everybody else. So you want to start understanding these things. And the things to look out for is you want to know the terminology of the field. Different fields have different terminology. There are some that, of course, overlap. Things like bleed, things like kill fee, that sort of stuff. You need to know exactly what it means. You also want to start getting an understanding of who the big players in the industry are. Not only who the great designers or artists are, which is very important, but also what the big companies are. What are those clients that seem to hire a lot of people, carry a lot of respect? Uh, for instance, I do a lot of fantasy and science fiction illustration. And everybody knows in the entire industry who Wizards of the Coast is. Everybody wants to work for them because they're a big name. They have some great products, and they pay pretty well, too. So if, if I was talking to a student, and they were telling me how they wanted to become a fantasy and science fiction illustrator, and I tell them that Wizards is a great company to shoot for, they're a fantastic company to work for, and all of a sudden they have no idea who Wizards is, I'm immediately going to know that they don't know that much about the industry, that they haven't done their research. And... Once you know that, you're not going to be as eager to give them information because you know they're not putting out the effort. So you need to do that research yourself to be able to show people that you understand this. You know what you're at going after. Now you're probably wondering, how do you research these things? How do you get all this information so that you can know where you're headed, that you can ask intelligent questions, that you can speak intelligently about the field you want to work in? And I will say that one of the best ways to get this information is either on forums or on blogs. Uh, industry professionals are all over those places. The internet has been a wonderful resource for the creative industries. So quickly search online and find out what the big forums are, the big communities that you want to get into, the ones you want to start reading. 
And I will say a few because I'm an illustrator and I'm a fantasy sci-fi kind of guy that, for instance, one of the good forums you can go to is conceptart.org. And that's a fantastic community with a lot of professionals in it and a ton of great information. And now there are forums like that for every field and every specialty that you would want to go into. Now I'll be sharing some inside information from my own personal experience. Uh, hopefully some information that won't get me into any trouble because uh, naturally some things you aren't really supposed to talk about, but I'll try to do my best. Now there's one last point that I want to make before we start to get into the really nitty gritty stuff of portfolio building and then marketing and all the rest. And that is, what do you do if you can't seem to get work? You do all the things I'm about to tell you with portfolio building and marketing, and you just can't seem to get work. And there's a very simple answer to this, and it's one that most people just don't want to hear, because it's really tough. But you need to hear it if you're struggling, you can't seem to get work, you're doing everything you know how to, but you just can't do it. And the simple fact is, is that if you can't get work, then your work needs to improve. Now I will say there is the case that perhaps your work is fine, but it's your marketing skills that are lacking. And we'll work on that later in this video. But if your marketing seems fine, then it really just does come down to your work and you need to improve your work. And the first thing you need to do is like any good, you know, 10 step program is first you need to admit that your work needs improvement. And this is extremely hard for anyone to hear. Um, we take a lot of pride in our work and hearing that it's just not good enough is extremely difficult. But you need to humble yourself, buckle down and return to the basics. Get those fundamental skills nailed down. And if you're confused about maybe there's a specific area of your work that actually just needs work, just a little bit of polishing and you'll be there. And in that case, just ask some professionals to take a look at your work. Get their advice, get their input, find out those things that you really need to improve on. Because odds are, if you think you're at a professional level and you're just not quite getting that work, then you're probably less than a year away from getting full-time work. If you just buckle down and get that last little bit done, you put that last little bit of polish on your work to suddenly become professional. So with that, now it's time to get on to portfolio building. Portfolio building is without a doubt one of the most important things I'm going to talk about today. It is absolutely crucial no matter what sort of creative professional you want to be, whether it's a designer or an illustrator or photographer, your portfolio is where everything is at. Your portfolio is what defines you. Your portfolio is what will either launch your career or leave you without one. <laughs> 